Historically, fermentation referred specifically to the process of beer and wine making in which a sugar-rich mixture is converted to carbon dioxide and alcohol by incubation with a yeast. Today we use the term more generally to refer to the condition in which a microbe is grown in a medium conducive to its growth and the carbon source of the medium is converted to desired carbon-containing products. Microbes can be engineered to produce all sorts of chemicals through fermentation. When we speak of biosynthetic devices, we specifically mean a set of enzymes being introduced into an organism that augments those already present to redirect metabolism towards a particular product. Typically, this is a two-step process in which first the enzymes are identified that will perform the required chemistry needed to reach the product. Then in step two, the performance of that organism is optimized to its theoretical limits. This is often achieved by optimizing how much of each enzyme is produced in the cell, exchanging the choices from step one with other enzymes that do the same chemistry but perhaps express better, knocking up, down, or altogether removing native enzymes to redirect flux through metabolism to the desired pathway, and perhaps random mutagenic screens to identify unanticipated improvements to function. More recent ideas in this space include steps to re-regulate the enzymes involved through the use of stress-responsive promoters, the introduction of feedback through introduction of additional genes encoding transcription factors and special promoters, or through the inclusion of RNA elements such as riboswitches. Modifications to the biochemistry of the device are also being explored. This includes spatial localization of the reactions through the use of cellular compartments, including protein complexes, phage shells, or biomolecular scaffolds. Metabolic engineering refers to the discipline of trying to modify an organism to overproduce a chemical of interest. Historically, these chemicals were limited to those on the primary metabolic map. But in the past few decades, research has focused on grafting biosynthetic pathways from another organism into model organisms such as E. coli and yeast. Even when the target isn't a native metabolite, the carbon must still be shuttled from glucose in the medium to the product and thus must travel through primary metabolism. Thus, regardless of how complex the biosynthetic pathway is, it is important to optimize flux through some commonly observed intermediates in the cell. Some metabolites are common choke points for the production of large classes of chemicals. For example, all terpenoids came from different chain lengths of pyrophosphate, such as farnesyl pyrophosphate. This family of intermediates is present in most organisms, and these go on to produce complex natural products and other primary metabolites. Production of this intermediate is usually the choke point to finding how much product can be made. Similarly, the polyketide class is highly dependent on malonyl-CoA, whose production is often limiting. Acetyl-CoA is another common choke point in biosynthetic pathways. Primary metabolites are those chemicals that are necessary to produce the amino acids and nucleotides from glucose that support the production of proteins and nucleic acids that define the central dogma. The extreme majority of organisms have pretty much the same set of enzymes for making the primary metabolites. Though the line between primary and secondary is fuzzy, this later category represents those chemicals that cells make that aren't essential for the central dogma. They exist because they somehow facilitate the organism's survival in its environmental niche. However, they play no role in the central dogma. The class of secondary metabolites can be categorized into several major families defined by their branching off point from primary metabolism. The alkaloids are defined by the presence of an amine, which usually originates in an amino acid molecule, and very often that amino acid is tryptophan. The presence of this amine makes them basic molecules since the amine can pick up a proton from water. This property makes them separable using acid-base extraction methods which procedurally define the class during the early days of biochemistry. Since the historical classification of alkaloids is based on a physical property rather than a mechanistic or biological basis, this is a mechanistically diverse class which cannot be traced to one specific root primary metabolite in the cell. The terpenoids are defined by an origin of the molecule as an isopentenyl, geranyl, farnesyl, or geranyl-geranyl pyrophosphate intermediate. 
These chemicals are abbreviated as IPP, GPP, FPP, or GGPP and correspond to one, two, or three or more repeats of a repeated isopentenal unit. Here we see three of them. These intermediates can be cyclized enzymatically into various hydrocarbons which are further modified by oxidation and transferase reactions. The class is visually identifiable based on having a large all-carbon skeleton with 5, 10, 15, or 20 carbons with methyl groups hanging off every fourth carbon. Many of those carbons will be oxidized and decorated with heteroatoms, but if you ignore all this and just count the carbon atoms, you can see the terpenoid skeleton. Glycosides are molecules composed of sugar moieties linked by glycosidic bonds. This bond is defined by an acetal or ketal linkage where an sp3 carbon is linked to two oxygens. These linkages are made by a subclass of transferases called glycosyl transferases using a cofactor called a nucleotide sugar. Here UDP glycnac is the sugar donor. This class of cofactors is generated by reaction of a sugar with a nucleotide. The ribonucleotide UTP is the most common nucleotide source, but several other ribo and deoxyribonucleotides are observed for different sugars. The nucleophile that accepts the sugar moiety is usually an alcohol, and is very common for it to be another sugar moiety. However, all sorts of nucleophiles on all sorts of chemicals are known to form glycosides using these reactions. Some glycosides are small molecules such as the aminoglycoside antibiotic canamycin. This molecule is just three sugars linked together through glycosidic bonds. However, many of the more interesting carbohydrates form polymers of various structures and play important roles in organismal structure and cell-cell communications. Thus far we have discussed the secondary metabolites that result from nonofunctional enzyme reactions. In these biosyntheses, each enzyme does one step of the biosynthetic pathway and is not dependent on the presence of other enzymes to be able to catalyze this reaction. Another class of metabolites are polymeric and depend on polymer forming reactions that repetitively add similar metabolites to a growing linear chain. We'll come back to these in a later lecture. The polyketides are one such class frequently observed as antibiotics and other biologically active substances. They are defined by the reaction of malonate intermediates successively added to an initiating carboxylic acid. Polyketides are recognizable as all carbon skeletons with usually an even number of carbons. It is common to see methyl groups on every other carbon or at least spaced evenly across the backbone. Terpenoids always have the methyl groups on the fourth carbon, thus the patterning of the carbons allows you to distinguish these classes. The non-ribosomal peptides are a class mechanistically related to the polyketides and it is very common to have hybrid polyketide non-ribosomal peptide products. They are defined by repeated units of amino acids just like proteins. However, they aren't made on ribosomes and they usually contain non-proteinogenic amino acids such as this bromine substituted tryptophan residue. Just as glycosides are readily recognizable based on their glycosidic linkage, peptides are identifiable based on their peptide linkages. These categorizations of the natural product space are defined by similar reaction mechanisms and branching off points from primary metabolism. However, don't be fooled into thinking this space is simple or defined cleanly by these categorizations. It is very common to have hybrid metabolites that could be categorized in more than one class. Here a molecule first synthesized as a polyketide becomes a glycoside through further modification. I have introduced to you two categories of chemicals, small molecules and polymeric metabolites. The semantics of the term polymer is a little fuzzy in this context since these pathways are blended together so often. The basis for these two classes of metabolites is more precisely grouped based on a distinction between the enzymes involved. The small molecule class creates diversity through the use of monofunctional enzymes. These are the ones that work simply by binding to a substrate, doing some chemistry, and then releasing it. The polymer class is defined by large polyfunctional mega enzymes that operate like an assembly line. We'll come back to this when we discuss the polyketides in more detail.
If you want to transfer a biosynthetic pathway from one organism to another, you must identify the genes involved. There are a finite number of synthetic tricks that organisms use to make compounds. Because of this, you can often guess the biosynthetic pathway to a given compound based on a retrosynthetic analysis or by homology to known related pathways. Another tool is to use genetics. If the source organism is a microbe, you can easily mutate the organism, screen for a strain that does not produce the product. By examination of cell lysates, you can determine what chemical intermediates were lost due to the mutation and correlate this information with the gene that was mutated. Thus, you can deduce, deduce the pathway from primary metabolism to product. Another tool is to use isotopically labeled intermediates. If you know, for example, that your pathway needs to include charismic acid, you could acquire 13C or tritium labeled charismic acid, feed it to the organism, and then monitor the appearance of new compounds with the isotope label. These tools are usually used in conjunction with one another. In bacteria, the task of finding a pathway is usually much simpler than in eukaryotes. Frequent horizontal gene transfer and the ability to make multi-gene operons has the effect of pushing related genes together into clusters. Bacterial genomes are often neat and tidy with large islands dedicated to a particular biosynthetic pathway. Eukaryotes are another story. In plant terpenoid biosynthesis, for example, it is very common for many related compounds to be generated through competing reactions with multiple enzymes. In the genome, these enzymes could be located anywhere and aren't specific to any one pathway. Thus, prediction is far more difficult. Genetic screens, as discussed before, can be used to truncate pathways and thereby identify the involved genes one by one. Another approach is to use homology of the enzyme to known enzymes to design degenerate oligonucleotides to fish out candidate genes by PCR. When it is realistic to sequence the genome of the organism or its full cDNA population, this fishing expedition can be implemented computationally, and such approaches are becoming the norm. Another approach involves genetic selections and screens to sift through cDNA libraries. If all else fails, protein engineering continues to advance and sometimes an existing enzyme can be modified to accept a substrate that would not normally accept. However you do it, a complete cohort of enzymes is required to complete a biosynthetic pathway such that each intermediate from primary metabolism to product is satisfied.